In fantasy media, or any media that seeks to evoke a medieval-ish setting, we find guilds. Adventurers' guilds, merchants' guilds, craftsmen's guilds, all of these things are staples of fantasy discourse. But one of these things is not like the others. Craftsmen and merchants' guilds were real social groups during the medieval period, especially in Europe. The Adventurers' Guild... Not so much. Sure, exploratory expeditions were sponsored by nobles, states, and the church, but without monsters to slay and damsels in distress, adventuring was a relatively niche profession. All the way up until we get cartographers' guilds and geographers' guilds, we have no real organisation of people who call themselves adventurers or explorers. Even compared to these geographical societies, adventurers' guilds are very different. Monster slayers, fixers, odd job men, all picking from the collected list of quests. Unlike our craftsmen and merchants' guilds, nothing like that has ever really existed in our world. So today, let's examine what exactly a guild is and was, where this trope has come from, and how the adventurer's guild that we see so often in fantasy may actually make a lot of sense from a world-building perspective. Stick around till the end to hear how I managed to argue that. What do we know about guilds? Well, before there was industrialised labour, there were guilds, long before. The first guilds were social clubs, organised by like-minded people in ancient Roman societies. They were called collegia, and encompassed everything from merchants and traders, craftsmen, political alliances, and religious orders. It was essentially a way to formalise a group, allowing the sharing of collective assets and creating a stronger lobbying voice by being part of a community. Some of these collegia can be seen as potentially some of the earliest Western-style companies. If you were a craftsman, a trader, or most likely both, it would be an excellent idea to get yourself involved in the collegium that represents your craft. It allowed you to collaborate on pricing structures and act as more than an independent trader. Several attempts were made in the Roman era to ban this practice, most notably by Julius Caesar himself. But collegia endured. For most of late Roman history, even surviving into the Byzantine Empire after the West fell. All the while, the concept of a workers' guild was being slowly refined. By AD 900, we see Byzantine collegia narrowing down their specialism into specific crafts and trades. Butchers, bakers, and indeed candlestick makers ran their own collegia as independent units to protect their specific trade and their specific industry. Especially in larger cities where these craftsmen were better able to organise collectively. And by this point, the collegia themselves required specific rules, specific practices, and quality controls for any products. Around this time in Europe, and continuing on for a little bit, being a merchant was a horrible profession. You were constantly on the move, shifting goods from place to place in the hopes that your knowledge and your speculation would inform you where these goods are going to be most valuable. You were at risk of bandits, highwaymen, and wild beasts out on the roads. It was a lonely life. The only people who could really understand and relate to you were other merchants. So, naturally, merchants banded together. And as they did, they found they could not only rely on each other for protection on the road, they could also share in all sorts of other ways, from sharing knowledge to divvying up the more unpleasant tasks. And so, in the burgeoning European economy of the 11th century, merchant's guilds were born, or depending on your definition, 
reborn. This allowed merchants to protect their trades through collective investment, facilitated larger scale and longer distance trading opportunities, and crucially allowed some merchant masters to actually settle in towns, safe in the knowledge that their fellow merchants would be spread out across the local community, essentially doing their old job for them. All of a sudden, merchant became a desirable profession for some. And these burgeoning guilds bloomed, being able to create monopolies on trade goods, control distribution and prices, and stop other sellers from selling their wares on their turf. I think it's time for a little detour on our way to discuss the pre-industrial labour market. Firstly, kiss your weekends goodbye. The largely Christian Europe observed Sunday as a holy day, and so tended not to work on that particular day, but Saturday was not quite so lucky. Many worked for most of the day, with some having Saturday afternoons off. But for self-directed professions like farming and early mercantilism, you had to work as many hours as there were in the day to get a competitive advantage on your fellow traders. Thankfully, for everyone's sanity, candles and oil were a little too expensive to make it a regular habit to work long into the night. But that doesn't mean that merchants were always off the road come nightfall. Sometimes you simply had to travel throughout the night to the next safe place. A small saving grace for those who were actually able to stay at home was the relatively common practice of waking up partway through the night, setting a candle or lamp, and having some family time or personal time for your projects. This would last for an hour or two before you went back to bed for your second sleep until the morning. So, as you may be able to tell, working was largely determined by the light. During the summer months, a farmer may easily end up working 16 hour days, but during winter that same farmer may be confined to his home, working on his personal secondary craft projects, or doing home-based labour, as his family does the same. So, the world of work is very, very different to how it seems now, when we see our guilds blossoming. Almost everyone has some small craft to keep them going throughout the winter, or to at least prepare for a more profitable summer. This pushing and pulling in profitability is not an easy thing to navigate, and the idea of selling your family's crafted skill out of a workshop, say, is a relatively attractive one, because that's a business that can work during summer and winter months. Of course, your workshop needed to be well known and have no direct competition. Both of those problems were solved by the introduction of the Craft Guild. You see, by collaborating with local people in local craft communities, you could negotiate who makes what specific items, while also ensuring that all of the products that come out of your town and your workshop are of a satisfactory quality. And crucially, the ability to promote your town as a haven for this specific craft, trade or industry. Now we understand what guilds are for and how they came to be, let's tackle this anachronistic Adventurer's Guild. The concept of the Adventurer's Guild comes mostly from fantasy games. There are some few examples of similar things in fantasy works before this, but it's worth noting that their main introduction comes through gaming culture. Starting out with the granddaddy of role-playing games, Dungeons and Dragons, we see a clear and deliberate need for a place where quests are simply given to the players. There is a clear need for a context for adventuring. D&D began as two or three games stuffed into one. One was a broad map-based exploration on the way to the quest, and another was a smaller scale, grittier, more personal, dungeon skirmishing tactical adventure. The narrative throughline was the quest, a discrete unit of adventure that needs to be communicated, embarked upon, and completed 
before session or stories end. The most convenient way to organise this in game design? Well, a central hub location, where these quests are given out and the rewards from them collected at the same spot. This concept of a job or notice board in the centre of town grew into the idea of an adventurer's guild, as we see in an awful lot of fantasy gaming media nowadays. But we especially see it in anime. Why does anime specifically have such a fascination with this concept of the adventurer's guild? While Western fantasy media has a long and storied history of borrowing from the greats and the classics, those seminal works written far, far before RPGs came into the world. Japanese fantasy tradition was entirely different. So for some creatives in the Japanese media landscape, Dungeons and Dragons, when it came over, became the sort of groundwork, the classic, of the Western fantasy, at least gaming, genre. Especially as video games, a Japanese specialty, began exploding in worldwide interest. From Dragon Quest all the way through to modern anime, concepts of the Adventurer's Guild and slimes as introductory enemies both seem to be ported somewhat from Dungeons and Dragons and they emerge as these strange ubiquities which flavour Japanese fantasy worlds. And the Adventurer's Guild structure for gaming makes an awful lot of sense. As mentioned earlier, it's helpful to have a hub location that your players can keep coming back to to get new quests and new content. And it's also helpful to delineate the tasks they can do by how difficult they are, using difficulty classes. Although, why Japanese media doesn't take into account the guild portion of the Adventurer's Guild by calling them Apprentice, Journeyman and Master levels of difficulty is beyond me. That's right there. Instead, we tend to use metals or letter ranks. So with all that said, all that history and media criticism discussed, how could an actual fantasy adventurer's guild function? First, it's likely to be a hybrid between the craftsman's and the merchant's guild setups that we discussed earlier. Adventurers are itinerant travellers in most fantasy media travelling from town to town through wild spaces, never really finding a safe place to rest their heads because the next quest, the next job or the next villain has arrived. This fits the journeyman classification of a guild membership very well indeed, as journeyman members were expected to go out into the world and pra practice their trade in other locations. Apprentice adventurers are the ones who study the adventuring craft through rat catching and direct client supervision, while master adventurers would be guild masters, marshalling a collection of ragtag adventurers under their command and sending them on quests around the local region, much like in a merchant's guild. Or they will be master adventurers, still active in the field, taking on the hardest challenges to get the best results they possibly can, as the most experienced adventurers out there. Of course, both types of master, master adventurer and guild master, would both have the responsibility of teaching and tutoring the next generation of adventurers. Depending on how high fantasy your world is, these guilds could have a responsibility for a small locality or a large swath of land. Perhaps they even go international if your magical or technological communications tech is powerful enough. But why would an adventurer's guild establish itself in the first place? Adventurers are known to be strange folk and not the most tied down or social of creatures. Well, this too we can learn from the advent of merchants' guilds. As stated, being a merchant was a really horrible profession in the early medieval period. You were relying on your and your master's ability to speculatively beat the market while travelling all around your local region, hoping that the wares would not go bad or get broken in transit. And of course, that you wouldn't die or get robbed. We can think of adventurers in a similar way. In a fantasy world that includes threats like dragons or 
hydras, or even just wolves that are twice as big as the ones we know from our world, leaving the walls of a city is a heck of a lot riskier. It's likely that the adventurer profession evolves around the merchant profession, starting with simple hired swords to protect merchant caravans in transit. It would carry on in this vein until some clever individual decides that they'd rather the problem was simply gone for good, exterminated, so they don't have to keep hiring these hired hands for every single journey. These hired goons would start getting hired to take out threats preemptively, protecting merchant caravans not by wandering alongside them for days on end, but by doing a single task, a single surgical strike. A quest, if you will. Having spent some time around this mercantile guild system, your adventurers may start to get some similar ideas. I would expect a particularly enterprising adventurer getting on in his years, seeing a merchant guildmaster living a life of luxury, it's staying in the same place and just organising the people around him to think, well why don't I try something similar? After all, this adventurer would have years worth of connections and a realistically pretty fast approaching sell-by date. At this moment, an adventurer's guild is born. Structurally, it would look quite similar to a merchant's guild, where the central guild master sits in a hub location and sends apprentices and journeymen out to do the actual work, using, of course, the accrued knowledge of the guild master to pick the best contracts and negotiate fees. Crucially, this guild would pretty easily be able to enforce a monopoly. You see, craftsmen's guilds were able to establish their monopolies pretty early, by virtue of being the only people in town, a collection of them, sure, but the only people in town able to do a specific craft or make a specific item that was necessary. Adventurers, who are hired to protect people and to slay monsters, have a skill set that is not easily replicable. Any collection of towns operating with an adventurer's guild in play would simply put a blanket ban out on any hired swords or spellcasters that were not part of the guild's structure. Unfortunately for the local area, this could mean that the local adventurer's guild could actually become a massive political power, either through intense and powerful lobbying or a mafia-style protection racket for the highest bidders. Indeed, considering all the uproar we saw with the power of the Collegia in Rome, it's most likely that a group of people who are trained with the blade are going to be a heck of a lot more dangerous politically and uh, protection racket-wise than a collection of stonemasons. After all, they're the insane individuals who go outside the city walls and kill monsters. They're armed to the teeth, they're practically unionised, and they've seen far more action than your local guardsman or militiaman. The biggest obstacle to an adventurer's guild actually setting up then is local law and local nobility. If a landowner allows such a guild to establish itself, he may reasonably expect that the price of protection will continue to skyrocket, as this guild would have a monopoly. And he may also anticipate that his lands may become increasingly unsafe, unless people agree to continue paying the extortionate fees. On the other hand, if they ban such a guild from forming, there may be two very unpleasant responses. Firstly, the merchant's guild would almost certainly lobby for the creation of an adventurer's guild, as their business relies on being protected by the monsters and the magic of the world. And secondly, the adventurers may threaten to take their business elsewhere. You see, any place that has a formalised collective of monster slayers, hunters and guards is certainly a more attractive place for any reasonable person to be. And when a landowner's town is under threat of competition, well, he may well have to buckle. So, throughout history, people have created guilds or guild-like organisations for so many 
different reasons. To set basic standards for a profession. To create a collectively bargained monopoly. Or simply to make their profession easier, more collaborative, and do each other's advertising. Adventurers guilds in fantasy would exist for pretty similar reasons. To stop ill-equipped fools going out with the wrong equipment, no training, and just dying. To ensure that adventuring is paid fairly by collaborating and centralising contract prices, or simply to enable explorers to more easily share in their resources, their advertising, and their services. In any fantasy setting where heroism can be commodified, i.e. people are paid to go and fight against monsters, there may well be knights, but there will almost certainly also be independent contractors. After all, our world history is littered not only with formalised soldiers, but also vast and impressive mercenary companies. Any such world will see adventurers organise, at least somewhere. And where workers in a dangerous field organise, it tends to lead to fewer fatalities and better industrial standards. We must remember that just because the Adventurer's Guild fantasy trope started as, really, a way to force players to use a central hub location and get the adventuring going quickly, that doesn't mean that it's not a really interesting idea that we should be porting into our fantasy settings. After all, the original Collegia covered almost every form of collective expression. From work, to religion and politics. And in a normal-ish fantasy world, much of the concern of regular citizens would be given over to how their labour and their lives may be affected by the horrid monsters that lurk out there. Yes, in many places the guardsmen and knights are responsible for dealing with such things. But when their resources are stretched thin, that's when adventurers start to take root. And much like the rats they slay, adventurers given respect and proper reward will multiply, organise and become too integral a part of a settlement to be ignored. That's why I believe that the Adventurers Guild is not a trope that should be limited to gaming or JRPG inspired anime. It's a legitimate world-building tool that we can all use to inject some politicking and trade disputes into our fantasy towns and our fantasy monster slayers. After all, that's what everyone loved so much about the Star Wars prequels, right? Thank you for watching. I hope this has been an interesting look into a much maligned trope of video game style fantasy, and I hope that you've got some ideas from it on how to integrate the concepts of organisation, uh, collective labour, and trade unions into your world. Even when it comes to the big old monster slaying. If you've got any cool examples of adventurers guilds done right, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. And of course, if you think I've got something wrong or you just disagree with some of the points I made here, feel free to let me know in the comments. There's no reason that I read every single one unless it's to understand where I can improve and where our mindsets may simply differ. That's always part of the fascination to releasing a video like this. In any case, if you'd like to see more like this, please do subscribe. But with that said, I've been Tom, otherwise known as the Grungeon Master, and I will see you in the next video.